Uh, my presentation is going to be uh, to try and generally set the scene, and I'm going to leave it to Etienne to talk about uh, a lot of the more technical details and how we do some of our data science. But I wanted to start with uh, with a much more sort of general question of uh, what is in, a, in the Wolf view, what is what is data science, and what are we trying to do with our data science? So give me a moment here, and I will uh, uh, show my screen here and uh, save some bandwidth for everyone by turning the webcam off. Uh, and I wanted to start by with a, addressing really one thing that I've heard repeatedly when I go and talk to customers about data science, which is they end up, uh, they go out and they hire a bunch of data scientists because they feel like that's the new thing that needs to be done. But then when they look back a little bit later, they realize that they're just paying a bit more money to do the same old statistics that they were de doing before data science became the in thing. So is data science just a synonym for statistics? Well. I'm going to define it slightly differently, and it seems like a subtle difference that data science is computation with data. But if you look at that from the context of what we've been doing with the Wolfram language for the last nearly 30 years, computation is a really broad subject. It includes things like classical statistics, but it's also things like uh, machine learning, which you'll hear about from Etienne in half an hour, uh, and all kinds of other computation like geometry and image processing and uh, textual semantic analysis and audio and uh, and uh, so visualizations and uh, simulations, all of these different things are, are computation. And with a little bit of imagination, they can all be applied to data and to get insights from data, which in the end is what we're trying to do with data science. So if computation is the big thing rather than, rather than statistics, what, what's, what does that give you that uh, classical statistics, which really centers around counting, doesn't give you? Well, the first thing is it gives you new things to count, but you can do statistics on new kinds of data if you can pull that data out of, out of the underlying data in more interesting ways. So I brought a few examples. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, the work we do in our technical services is under non-disclosure. So I'm bringing some work from some of my uh, from least paying customers. Uh, this first one comes from a little project I did with my daughter. Um, she was uh, wanting to write an essay about uh, Lord of the Flies, her favorite book, and uh, she wanted to inject a bit of data science into it to make it not just literary analysis. And she said, well, where do the characters occur in the book? So we did this uh, little piece of basic counting where we looked at the character names and where they occurred throughout the book. So from the beginning of the book, you get an early appearance of Ralph who takes the lead in the book. Warning here, I'm gonna spoil, uh, I've got a few spoilers of the story here. Um, there's an early appearance of the beast when they're exploring the island, but it doesn't become significant until the middle of the book. Uh, which sort of precedes the rise of Jack, who uses fear of the beast to take control. So that seemed like a pretty satisfying result in terms of counting, but it, that was as far as pure statistics seemed to get us. And it didn't tell us anything about the tone of the book. And this was meant to be an uh, English literature essay, not a maths essay. So we started talking about, well, what else could we count? And we started finding, thinking about things like uh, applying some basic machine learning to do things like sentiment analysis on the sentences. So we went through the sentences one at a time and says, what, what's the probability that each of those sentences is positive? And we can use that as a measure of, the, um, of how positive the sentiment sentences are. And here's the maximal. I've just searched the entire book just now as we were speaking and found the sentence that's most likely to be a positive sentence. We're going to have fun on this island, which um, for those of you who read the book isn't really how it pans out. But once we had this new tool, we had something new to count. And so we went through using that as a new measure and overlaid on top of the previous plot, this measure of the tone of the book. And it reveals some quite interesting human insights that the tone is quite negative at the beginning, they're shipwrecked. It's really positive when they're having fun exploring the island. And then it goes a bit neutral. And then as the antagonist takes power, things go a bit negative. Things pick up as our lead character tries to regain control, and then things go rapidly downhill towards a rather bleak end to the book. So there we have something that, that it's a new kind of information that was in the words, but it wasn't the words that we were doing statistics on. Uh, here's a, and you know, when you think about the different kinds of data, every data comes with its own ontology of, of computation. So there are things like sentiment that applies to text, but sentiment wouldn't apply very well to geometry, but things like shape and curvature apply to geometry. And if you look at things like image processing, we can do exactly the same thing and say, let's find new ways to count what we see by doing it by images. So this was another non-paying project that I did. This is uh, my wife's work. She's doing needless injection systems. So these are particles of would-be drug 
shot like a shotgun through this layer of skin. This is actually a, a sort of fake proxy for skin. But then what she needs to count, how deep do the particles go and uh, how clustered are they? And if they're too dense, it does damage to the skin. If they're not going deep enough, the drug doesn't get delivered. So that's pure statistics, but we have to get to the point where we can count things. So I looked at the problem and thought, well, we've got these blobs here. We've got it uh, zoomed in. We can clean that by turning it black and white and getting rid of small components. And that gives us a simplified version. And then we have to deal with the fact that they're touching. This is two blobs, not one. So the solution that I came up with was to look at the distance from the edge. So points near the edge have a short distance and points in the middle of a high distance. And if you show that as a color, you end up with this sort of uh, what's called a distance transform of the image. And now we're able to start picking out the separate points. You can see there's different peaks that are slightly higher away from any points that they touch. So if we pick out the maximum of those, we now have countable points, even though the original was quite fuzzy, messy, and uh, touched other points. So if you put that into a little blob of code here to do that in an automated way, so I needed to have uh, loaded the image first of all, uh, to apply that to the entire image, then we can identify automatically the things that we want to count, put little crosses on them in this case to identify their position. And you can see across the image as a whole, it's done a pretty good job of picking those things out. And now we move to statistics and we can start doing things like saying, well, what's the average density? So here, if I just rotate this plot around, you have um, depth going from the top of the image to the bottom and height is the, the number of particles in that area of the image. So you can see already a couple of insights that that they're get reaching a fairly consistent depth. They're mostly getting to a certain uh, similar depth, but the density is kind of around the edges of the target zone, not in the middle. Okay, what else can we do with computation? Well, another thing we can do is to inject context. But very often data is not very meaningful to us as humans because we're not really geared at looking at data. And the classical statistics uh, approach to data handling is to reduce the data into something that human brains can handle, which is why we look at numbers like the mean and the standard deviation, because that's a way of reducing all that mess and complexity of a data set down to two numbers, and we can handle two numbers. But there's other ways to make data more understandable. And a key one of those is, to, is as I say, to inject additional context. So here's a data set that I, I looked at a while ago. I just refreshed this today with the very latest data. Um, I'm speaking to you from the United Kingdom where uh, Waltham's European headquarters are. And here we run a system of uh, the local authorities rate the hygiene of every place that serves food in the country. So here's some hygiene ratings uh, for, um, these are all places in Oxford, around the corner from where I am here. And there's a restaurant called the 1738 Cafe and it's got a perfect rating. These are zero to five rating so it's perfectly clean food and somewhere further down the list we've got Acropolis which is a three out of five which is uh, I think in need of improvement but you know there's thousands and thousands of data points there's 1334 just for, for the for the Oxford city alone and there's tens of uh, or hundreds of thousands across uh, the United Kingdom as a whole how can you get a sense of what's going on well one thing is to bring in other information that's outside of this data set and the obvious one here is to bring in things like uh, mapping information so now I can take that data set and I can throw all of those points into a map of Oxford. And you can immediately see where the food uh, supply places are centered, that they, they are lots in the city center as you would expect as a tourist attraction that Oxford is. Um, there's a lot heading up uh, this road and this area of town and then scattered through the, the um, places that people live over to the, um, the east of Oxford. But then by laying computation on top of that, we can start pulling out some interesting insights. Here's the same map again, but looking at what the typical trends are. And now you get the kind of interesting insights that the lowest hygiene on average is in this area called Cowley Road. Well, that's where all the students live. So uh, there's a lot of student accommodation and, uh, and student flats around this area. And all the best hygiene's up in this north area. Well, that's where the, uh, all the rich people live. That's the million pound house district of, of the of the city and there's a generally low area somewhere around the station uh, where a lot of people are passing through uh, transiently and actually if you want to go sightseeing in the uk here's the uh, the overall trend uh, across the country and generally you can see if you know your british geography that the these are urban centers that have the lowest food hygiene that uh, out on the they're down at to the four out of five on average whereas some of the more rural areas are um are averaging closer to five out of five and that made me think, well, we can inject some more context here. This was a hypothesis that I was seeing this urban uh, band across the middle of the country and across the, the west of the country. 
what if we actually do that point by point? So just before I came on, there, just an hour ago, I ran this. I looked at every point and I said, let's look up the population of the city that that point is in. And you get this interesting trend that I wasn't expecting that it does, the hygiene does go down as the population of towns increases, but actually it goes down pretty rapidly for small places from uh, thousand uh, person villages uh, down to about the 10,000 person small town. And then it seems to improve a bit as you go into the cities. Who knows what that means, but it's insight that you can only get by pulling in external data like maps, like populations. Um, if you're looking at things like the accidents example, I don't have time for comparing to weather on the day and things like that. And that's why what one of the things that we do at Wolfram is to try and automate as much as possible about bringing external data in. And we have thousands of data sets from where earthquakes are, share prices, all of these kinds of things are built into the language so that you can bring in the context and comparison. Uh, against the data that you bring to the table. Okay, another thing for computation to, to bring us. Um, another thing we can do is we can use computation to twist data around and think about things from different viewpoints. So I've got a, a fairly simple example, but this one does come from, uh, from an external organization that I dealt with. I, I met the guys that, who are on the Bloodhound project and they're trying to make a supersonic car. Uh, sorry, they're trying to make a car that make, is going through a thousand miles an hour. And their previous car was supersonic. And this was some data they gave me. And they gave me about uh, 50 channels of telemetry from this supersonic car and said, see what you can make of this, just as a kind of discuss, discussion point. So here's two data streams that came off the car. This is the, uh, the RPM of the front right wheel. It's a proxy for the speed of the vehicle. It's not strictly the speed because when you go really fast, uh, sand starts behaving like a liquid and the thing starts the car's a bit more like a boat but as a rough proxy it tells us the velocity of the vehicle and the dots are the front right suspension load how much weight the suspension was taking on that wheel so it's you know you can see the car got faster and the suspension uh, jiggled around a bit more in the middle of the run but it's not deeply insightful but just by using exactly the same data streams and changing the viewpoint, we can get some different insights out. So I hit it with a little bit of basic calculus. So here's the velocity. Obviously, the first derivative is the acceleration. And you start seeing that the acceleration is not perceptible from the curve, but it actually goes up in steps. So we, we get a step, rise improving acceleration, stepwise, stepwise. Then it's at this high acceleration. And then we get this curve drop to zero. And then it's massive stepwise negative change in acceleration. And actually context is what makes this make sense. If we throw on the throttle position, you can actually see that the, the driver or pilot, I don't know what he described himself as on a, on a supersonic car, but um, he's easing the accelerator up in steps, seeing how the car responds before he finally, at, uh, at about three and a half thousand timestamps into this, goes to full throttle and puts the jet engine to maximum. And there, I'm guessing that this is air resistance building up. It's still at full throttle, but the air resistance gets to the point where it's no longer getting any faster. He takes his foot off the accelerator and air resistance now becomes effectively a massive windbreak. The other dimension was a little bit trickier. Um, there, I had to think about this thing from more from a signal processing point of view, that we've got an amplitude, but actually what's interesting here is frequency. So by just switching the viewpoint here into frequency space, this is time along the bottom, frequency up the side, and the brightness is uh, the amount of intensity, you suddenly see two really interesting features pop out here and here, that there's a sudden spike in high frequency, and then it drops down again, and a sudden high spike in high frequency, and then it drops down again, and then you get this uh, very strong spike at the end. And I, I couldn't make sense of this, but the engineers immediately uh, uh, said they got excited and said, we've never seen this before. What you're seeing here is the moment the top edge of the wheel goes supersonic because the top edge is going twice as fast as the bottom edge uh, than the car as a whole, because it's traveling forwards uh, while the car's, um, well, the bottom of the wheel is sort of going backwards. And so even though this wasn't a supersonic run, we're getting a shock wave forming as it enters and exits the sound barrier uh, on the top edge of the wheel. And this is the brakes being applied at the end uh, after the parachute's deployed. So suddenly features pop out that if you look at the data, yes, you could see there's something going on here, but it's, it's, it becomes much, more subtle and you certainly don't see the, the later one very easily. But by switching the viewpoint, we can, um, we can pull out new insights. So another um, thing we can do with computation uh, is to inject completely new viewpoints. Rather than simply switching things around, we can just change the way that we, the, the way we conceptualize data 
and bring in computations from fields that you never thought applied in that area. And I've got a simple um, example that I did with a, a customer that uh, to me was quite, quite a fun sort of use of out of scope computation. So the challenge was uh, the customer had these um, portfolio correlations. So what this is, is uh, if, you want a, if you want to reduce risk in a portfolio, you don't buy all shares that move in the same direction at once because you either make a lot of money or you lose a lot of money. And if you want stability, you want to mix things up a bit that don't all move in the same direction to give some stability. So this is just a statistical table of the correlations that this ATHX is, as you would expect, perfectly correlated with itself, but it has a slight anti-correlation with PFBX. And his question for us was, uh, these numbers are important, but they're really hard to get your head around, a big table of numbers. He said, can you make this into a nice grid of colors? So we did that. We said, okay, here's a visualization of it. And maybe we can make it slightly better by allowing you to uh, set some threshold and just pick out those that are meeting a threshold. But there's still no kind of sense of structure. There's no real insight. It just allows you to uh, hone in on the, the, the key values quicker. So we decided to give them a, a, a new insight. And we took an idea from, um, from zoology. Uh, the I first saw this uh, with dolphin populations, which was to measure which dolphins hung out with each other but then to try and figure out what the families are from the collections of these pairings. So by considering these things as pairings, we can now pull out those that met the high threshold and build the families of the pairings. So here we've got a pairing that says this BIOS share is highly correlated to Andy, and Andy is highly correlated to WBMD. But collectively, they start forming this family. Even though uh, BIOS isn't highly correlated to SRCL, when you start looking at the relationships, they're only sort of uh, four or three relationships away from each other. And because of the common strength across there, we end up with this form family forming. And if we change the correlation, we can see different families. Now, as is often the way with, with good data science, it doesn't necessarily provide you answers. It's sort of a classical statistics thing to say, here's the answer I want, and now I'm going to measure it. Modern data science is very much often about pulling out insights that are questions for you as a human to then consider what is it that these uh, things all have in common that means they move as a family. Maybe it's something very obvious, like they're all energy stocks and these are all building stocks and these are all banking stocks. But maybe there's something more subtle going on that, uh, that causes this movement correlation between uh, the assets. And only by pulling them out and highlighting them to you, are you able to do the more human task of, of using intelligence to try and uh, answer, answer the sort of broader, softer questions? that hard data science can provoke. Uh, and of course, in the end, one of the things that we're trying to do with computation is to separate that signal from noise that's in the data. Data is filled with signals, but it's also filled with noise, and we have to separate those. So I wanted to show one that's really quite a long way from what you think of as classical data science, and, is, and it popped into my head that this was a good example when I was thinking signal from noise, because here is actually literally a noise with a signal in it. So hopefully that comes across the uh, the seminar software and it's the sound of a, a car going past. It's going as it goes past. So the sound there is is all kinds of frequencies and the engine noise and there's a bit of road noise in there as well. But actually the signal we want or the signal that's interesting here is a speeding ticket because if we pick through this and look at things like the frequencies, uh, so here's how the frequency shifted through that, add those together and make an average, we get an average frequency shift. We do some something you wouldn't think of more as physics modeling. We can look up the formula for Doppler shift. And this is, uh, I guess, straight out of Wikipedia. This is the, the way sound is shifted by, by being coming from a moving source. We can then fit that to the result and end up with the parameter estimates. So you'd think of that more as modeling, but here I'm taking data and I'm pulling out insights. That's data science from my book. So here's the final insight. The velocity here is 19.47 meters a second, so about 30, 40 miles an hour. So in an urban area, that would be a speeding ticket. And indirect, we also end up finding out that the vehicle came within 4.7 meters of the observer. So um, not too close that the, um, the microphone was, was set well back from the road uh, as the vehicle went past. But that's all buried in that sound. And when you start asking these questions about, uh, I've got this data set of all these sort of 30, 40 measurements of some uh, behavior of my customers or behavior of some engineering device that I've built, 
the insights are often not just the, well, what's the biggest of this parameter? What's the smallest of that parameter? What's the average of this parameter? The insights are often much more subtle and you have to have these creative questions of what could be hidden there and then use the full power of computation to extract those out. So if data science is more than um, just counting, why is it that most data science in practice in the wild is various forms of just counting and doing statistics? And there's two answers to that. One is computation can be difficult. And the other is that you've got to know what's possible. Now, the second one's a, a really an educational question that uh, knowing the, the what all of the possibilities of computation out there are and the kind of tool set available is something now educational system has to address. And I have lots to say about that, but that's a subject for another day. So I'm going to address this issue of, of the difficulty of computation. And really, that's something that we've been focusing on for a long time. And the answer to all of that is automation. But is automation at a higher level than, than software typically targets? Because technical software typically automates the application of an algorithm. But what we want to do is always to automate the knowledge required to apply the algorithm. So sort of higher level. I'm going to skip through this example quickly because I'm overrunning time and because Etienne is going to go through this, uh, how things like uh, classify and uh, and predict work uh, uh, much better than I will. But I'm just going to show a quick example here to make really one, one point. So this is a classic data set. These are passengers of the Titanic. This passenger was a first class 29 year old female and she survived. And we've got 1,309 data points. And I want to do some machine learning to try and predict uh, what would happen if I were to travel on the Titanic. So I'm asking it to classify the data. You notice here, I'm not having to say anything more. I just say classify. And it's automating as much as possible. It figured out that it's uh, nominal, numerical, nominal category, nominal, numerical, nominal, that the classes are died and survived. And most importantly, out of about eight or 10 different uh, algorithms, it's decided for itself which algorithm to use. And then it's applied the algorithm. So it's come up with a decision tree. In this case, it's decided as most appropriate. And then using that decision tree, I can make my prediction of, uh, I guess I've grown a bit older since I wrote this example. Um, uh, what would have happened to me on, on the Titanic. But once you have that level of automation, you can take that as broadly as possible. So where it's sort of automated the data types, well, that automation can be really, really broad. So if I take a completely different example and do kind of a computer vision example and take photos and say, are these nighttime or daytime photos? Well, if you look at it, I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm just saying what the task is, classify, and the input data and the output class. The fact that they're photographs in this case and the fact that in this case, it's going to use logistic regression over some key features, well, that doesn't matter to me. That's for when things get difficult or when I'm more of an expert. But as a beginner, I can just go in there and say classify and automation does as much as possible. And you can see here that it's done a reasonable job. The three nighttime ones it's got right. The three daytime ones it's got two out of three right. Not too bad. It's got this one a bit wrong. I don't know if the yellow is making it look like a neon light or the dark cars looking like nighttime, but something's confused in there. Now, I sort of alluded to this earlier, that one of the things we want data science to do is to actually automate the insights. Um, so sometimes we simply don't know what we're looking for. And, and really, that's where machine learning is, is extremely strong, where you're data rich, but understanding poor. And you don't know what the model is. You want it to suggest models, but sometimes even to suggest things that, um, that, uh, that, um, that you might want to look at as a model. So I'll just show a couple of examples of this uh, quickly. Um, I'm going to do a little Google image search here. So let's do something like uh, uh, pretty uh, villages. So I'm just uh, at this stage just doing a, a Google search uh, for uh, images that match that phrase pretty villages. And uh, if Google is going to be uh, nice and responsive for me, oops, I didn't want to show the code there. That's the code behind the example, but that's not the point here. Um, right, so what's a good one here? This looks a bit like a local village to me. That looks very Oxfordshire to me. So if I click on this image, I'm going to have a machine learning classifier use experience of photos. It doesn't know anything about the metadata to say, where does it look like in the world that it's? And, it's, uh, it, and I picked a good one here because it has basically said, here's Oxford. It's, it is very local to me. Actually, a bit further out, it thinks it's uh, closer to Bristol. Uh, our office is over here, but it looks very much like this part of the world. Whereas if I click on, uh, let's see, this one looks very un-English. We don't really go in for big turret towers very much here. Uh, and it thinks that looks like, um, 
Let's see Geneva over here. That looks like France by, yes, Limoges. So we're in France. It recognizes that. Now, what's the model for that? That's beyond me as a human. I would, I would look at this and I in fact just did in the same way in an experiential way. So those kind of insights of what are the features, well, we need to get that from machine learning. But we have, that changes the way we work with computers. We have to be treating computers like a member of the team rather than as a slave. So in the old days, you wrote an algorithm and you said, run the code, just like I guess in the 50s, you had employees and you would say, go and make me a cup of tea and do it this way. Now we expect employees to have a bit of insight of their own. Well, our supervision becomes a slightly more hands off. So the typical mode here for, um, uh, for supervising is just simply to provide evidence that uh, is useful. So I'm going to show you kind of how that might work in practice. I'm going to let's put this into a watch mode here. Uh, I'm going to grab screenshots and I'm going to teach it rock, paper, scissors, not how to play, just what they look like. So I'm going to pick rock here and capture some images. So I'm labeling this. I'm giving it supervision to tell it what these things look like. We're going to do about 10 of each. Uh, so that's some papers. And now we need to show it what scissors looks like. The universal symbols for rock, paper, scissors. And we've got a bunch of those. Let's do some training. And we were asking it to use some, uh, to inject the insight of what is it that makes a rock, paper, and scissors. And it's correctly said scissors, which you, it's seen that one before. But let's have it watch some it hasn't seen now. So those are scissors. Let's try a rock paper, scissors, and it's doing a fairly good job of recognizing what I'm doing from those 30 odd images that I've given it. So our job becomes more of a teacher than, than a controller when you enter the machine learning space. And sometimes we don't even give it any guidance. What we want to do is to have it suggest things that we might want to think about. So another sort of paradigm of that is the completely unsupervised learning. And I have one fun example to show here, which is, uh, um, a slightly contrived example because I know the result here, but uh, here's some pictures of dogs. I took this from the Stanford Dogs database you can download. It's got uh, about 100 breeds of dog. I've just took, taken three breeds here and about 20 images of each. And these are Chihuahuas, Basset Hounds and Wolf Hounds. But I'm not giving it any labels. These are just pictures. I'm not even telling it that they're dogs. I just wanted to examine that data and break them up into things that look similar and things that look different. And it's up to the computer to try and figure out what those features might be. So here's the visualization it's just come up with. And it's plotted this on a kind of two dimensional feature space where, uh, and you can see, you know, in this case, the clustering is very obvious to us as humans. These, it's clustered into the breeds of the dog. So we got all the chihuahuas have formed a cluster over here all the uh, wolf hounds over here and all the basset hounds over here. And then we've got some in the middle that, uh, that you know, this is a little bit unclear. Uh, in fact, I can't even tell looking at it. It looks like she might be holding chihuahuas, but it's the least chihuahua-like. It's the most basset-like chihuahua. And this basset is getting a bit close to the chihuahuas. It's the most chihuahua-like basset, I guess. Um, and, um, but what it's done here is it's put them into the groups that says, I think they, these things have something in common. Now, in this case, it's very obvious, um, partly because of the example set I've chosen and partly because we as humans do a very similar thing very well. that We sort of see visual similarities uh, very quickly. But if we did something that uh, was a little bit more abstract, and I, I, took, I applied exactly the same kind of idea to the share price movements on a set of shares beginning uh, um, uh, with the letter M, and we've got the same kind of clustering going on here. But this time, because I don't have any real insight, I don't know these things uh, off the top of my head, I don't see breeds of, uh, of share, and it's not obvious what the thing is that is causing the cluster. You might speculate that at this end of the plot, we've got shares that went up during the period and these en this end shares that went down, but maybe there are other features. What makes these four shares, uh, MSI, MSG, and uh, MSBF so similar? I don't know. But there's something in the data there that make that prompts me with the question of the, the machine learning suggests there's some similarity between these. Go away and think about what they might have in common. Maybe they all share the same uh, the same uh, PR agency or something, and uh, have all been putting out the right press releases at the right times. Or maybe they have something else in common. Or they're all energy stocks. It, it the answer isn't there um, without further investigation. But that insight of automated machine learning to tell me what I might look at. Is, is quite a high level interaction with the data. I'm a little over on time, so I'm gonna just um, talk about um, 
one aspect here, which is automation goes beyond just computation. The whole workflow of data science has to be automated. So, you know, if you think what the workflow is, you've got a sort of data capturing step or a data importing step. Then there's a sort of computation step. There might be a visualization step. There may be a loop that goes back around as you get insights and you direct more computation. Then there might be a reporting step where you're trying to produce something that's narrative to read for somebody else. And there might be a deployment step of, of delivering that in a way that somebody can interact with your insights or that can drive some other part of, uh, of the machinery of your organization. And what we want to do is to automate that whole workflow. Well, I'm just gonna pick out one part of it that's outside computation here, which is the deployment. And I'm just gonna pick out one aspect of that, the kind of non-human part, uh, just to show the kind of level of automation that, uh, that we can bring to bear here. This was the Titanic classifier that I, I made earlier in the talk. I can deploy that thing so that it can be computed from a database or from a website or a mobile app. And to do that, I want to have some kind of RESTful API service. Well, we have a symbolic representation of all of the machine learning, of all of the programming language of, of the Wolf language, of all of the visualizations. So all we have to do is copy that onto a, onto a cloud server that can run the Wolf language, and it can be run from there. So by wrapping this thing with a little bit of dressing to say, I want an API where I'm gonna pass three parameters in, and it's, what it's gonna do with it is to run our, our classifier that we built. Now we'll have to say is copy that to the server with cloud deploy and run this thing. There's a little bit of extra information like uh, what permissions it uh, has so that everyone in the world can see it. I might want to set that to private some secret key if it's gonna power some mobile app that I'm selling, but here I'm making it public. And that's all there was to the whole deployment cycle. If I open up a web browser now, uh, you'll see that uh, on this address that didn't exist uh, more than a few seconds ago, we've now, we're now serving up, uh, in this case, a failure mode. This is a bunch of JSON coming back saying that I haven't provided the parameters. So this is serving live computation uh, off a RESTful service in a machine-readable JSON format. And then it just becomes a step of, well, how do we embed that into something else? We can use templates to say, here's the Java that I would need to embed into a Java application to make a web services call. Or I could call it from some other application that knows how to access these services. And so for example, we have uh, a tool that you can plug into Excel that allows me to make Excel spreadsheets and I'll do machine learning. So here I'm running the same machine learning classifier off that address and it's, it's calculating machine learning from something as low tech as Excel. And the way it does it is this final cell makes a reference to the Wolfram API to the address that I, serve, I delivered it to with which parameters to pass. And that corresponds directly to this address that I served it on. So in one line of code, little more than the line that it took me to do the classification, I've delivered and deployed and uh, set up for external access this, this machine learning. And ultimately, the more you can deploy your machine learning, the more people you can use it, the, the more value you get out of the work um, uh, that you've done. So I wanted to leave a few minutes. I've got five minutes uh, to take some questions. So while you think about typing some questions into the questions panel uh, over on the side of the chat session, I'll just make a kind of quick closing remark about to sum this up, that when you think about data science, broaden your mind to the tool set because it is absolutely huge. And it isn't necessarily within the domain that you're working in. You might be working in, uh, in biological sciences and doing data science in that. Well, maybe there are th tools that are, were developed for engineering or for finance or, uh, or for human resource management that can be brought to bear. And automation makes them accessible to you because the concepts of what they do are usually a, a lot easier to read up on quickly than the details of being an expert in knowing which parameter is optimal for some particular circumstances and whether you should use this statistical test or that one. Automation makes them accessible to, on a conceptual level by getting rid of all of that difficult detail of doing the computation. So you're left to focus on just the question you're asking. And that lets you shift the, the process onto, um, um, uh, onto asking the right questions uh, and letting the data science, the computation, produce the, the kind of richest insights that you can from that. Um, so uh, there are some questions uh, coming in. Um, so um, one is uh, from uh, Mohsen. Um, they're interested in multilingual sentiment analysis. So 
we do have support uh, for uh, semantic text uh, in a multilingual space. So we uh, we know uh, about things like dictionaries of different languages and um, uh, and um, uh, the character sets that are relevant for which language and uh, um, uh, and translations between languages. So you know the, there's a couple of approaches you could take on this. You could use auto translation to put things into English and use the built-in uh, English classifier to try and detect sentiment. But ultimately, what you need to do is to generate uh, training data and uh, and retrain the classifier um, to use um, uh, or an appropriate classifier to use the training data that you have. So if you can find some source data that uh, I can't tell from your name what uh, language you're you're looking at, but if you can find source data in your language that can be labeled as positive or negative, um, then uh, uh, then you just simply run sort of a classify type command as I did uh, earlier on in order to learn what it is that are the words of your language that indicate positive or negativeness, um, and, then, uh, and then just use it the same way that I have with the built-in one that I showed earlier. Um, uh, how, uh, exactly, so um, in deploying a model um, to the cloud, can it be password protected? Yes, so, um, so actually if I go back to uh, the example I showed here, um, the um, permission structure here allows me to um, to control to individual named users. To uh, I can, there's a user groups mechanism. I can set things to be public, but you have to be logged in to access them. There is a design for a richer uh, mechanism for permissions that would allow you to say, you know, accessible only from uh, from French IP addresses after midday. Uh, from a Firefox browser kind of thing, but none of that's been implemented yet. So if you wanted to have rich permissions like time of day permissions, you would have to put that into the function that runs. But the permission structure allows you to control users and groups and uh, whether or not they can access, whether they can call the the, the, um, the service or not. And the same goes through for things like um, if I do a, a form page, for example, which is, I think I need to uh, probably turn up one of these options here. Um, if I set this up as a form, this is now meant for human use, and I can uh, type in that I am first class, uh, 21 year old uh, female, and click submit uh, and run it as a human. So this page here has the same permission structure um, that I had before. I can set that to be private to named individuals. Um, okay, so Mosin's clarified that uh, uh, the language is Arabic. Uh, I will say that there is a slight problem with Arabic, which is nothing, I don't think is uh, problematic at all from the machine learning point of view. Etienne can comment in uh, at the end of his talk, perhaps. Uh, we do have, uh, we don't have full support for um, display of Arabic within the Wolf language, but we're actually doing a project right now. Um, uh, uh, we're doing a project with Egypt to, to deploy lots of educational material for their learning system. And so we're, we're improving the Arabic rendering support uh, for the web first and also the notebooks uh, second, um, with which, so that should improve over the coming year. Um, is Wolf Language being used in industry uh, by data science? Yes. So um, um, uh, probably the best thing is to have a look at our website where there's a bunch of uh, user stories. Certainly, um, so one of the things I do for the company is I run a technical services group in Europe and we do the custom coding. So um, the sales guys just sell licenses of, of Wolf and Language, but we uh, take customer problems and code them up. Uh, and actually, by far the majority of my work is uh, in one form or another data science problems. Um, sort of, um, you know, usually um, and half of that is people who are interested in getting into AI and wanting to use machine learning. Um, but certainly we're not uh, we're not the only ones doing that using Wolf and Language. There's plenty of people where we provide the technology and they don't need our help at all and just get on with it. Um, uh, so the question about whether uh, companies used uh, uh, sentiments analysis within the organization to understand uh, um, data flow. It's a, it's a fine question. I don't have a good example of uh, that that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I had discussions with uh, an organization about using that for HR to try and spot uh, um, whether people were unhappy and likely to leave, but uh, we never actually did do that project. So 
Uh, it's certainly a, it's a feasible thing I've thought about, but I don't know of any specific examples. Um, if I need training off uh, offline, can I uh, model? Can I put the model in the cloud? Yes. So, so the object that comes back from the training. In fact, that's exactly what I did here. Was this Titanic survival? I trained uh, locally, and I could do that locally, uh, accelerated by GPU. But then I deployed it to the cloud. You can run it the other way around as well. You can have the cloud do the um, the training, and you could deploy it, for example, to a Raspberry Pi. So we have a version of the Wolfram language that um, that uh, that run that can run on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is very underpowered. It's a five dollar computer. So it, you wouldn't want to do your training on that unless you really had to, but it can run it perfectly adequately. So once you've got these models, they're portable between every version of, uh, of the Wolfram language. A uh, question about connection with R. We have a one directional connection with R that uh, allows us to call R to call R, R libraries that are sort of specialist in areas that we haven't covered. Um, to call from R to, um, to access Wolfram language capabilities, you'd have to probably use the or from script to use the kind of scripting level uh, at the operating system of the language. So you can run arbitrary uh, sort of bash type scripts of Wolfram language. I would love to go on. There's about four or five questions that maybe I will stay and answer um, through the chat system to those of you who haven't had time. But if I speak any longer, I will encroach on Etienne's talk, which promises to be very interesting. So please stay for that. And I will hand off to Etienne to show how some of this magic happens uh, inside the language. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was great to see you navigating the all those examples. Um, we're going to go ahead and push a second poll question out um, as we transition uh, to Etienne, our next speaker. And um, I can, yep, here it comes. So here's a poll question asking about um, your use of machine learning. And we're interested to see um, in what areas you in the audience are making use of machine learning in your work now, uh, if you are. All right. OK, so I see that uh, Alf, um, the person used traditional methods, uh, which is good. That's what we're going to talk about in this talk. Uh, then there's almost 40 percent do not use machine learning. So that's uh, that's uh, I mean, actually, that's not uh, that, that, that surprising, but but I guess uh, hopefully the, this talk might give some uh, and, and John's talk before some insight about how they, they can use machine learning, and 25% uh, that use deep learning. Okay, well, that's uh, it's interesting results that I will try to take into account during during my talk, and so um, I'm going to to be to go more into the details. Uh, compared to what John did, John did kind of a broad overview about what data science is. I'm going to talk about more of a specific part, which is a modeling uh, part. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk to a more restricted part, which is about the, the, the modeling, and uh, and about some recent effort that we've done to automatize this uh, modeling part. So, um, so here's just one example of what you could do with an automated data scientist. Uh, I mean, as you saw before in John's talk, there's many other tasks that you can uh, do with data science, but that's, I think it's a typical task because it involves uh, predicting something and in order to, 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 to get a result. So here's the idea is you have, a, let's say, a baker um, that uh, there's a, a bunch of, of data that is recorded um, in his bakery and uh, wants to plug uh, that sort of automatic data scientist software on the database and start asking questions to it. And uh, you could, for example, ask how many croissants are going to sell next Sunday. And, uh, and the computer will look at the recorded data and possibly other factors, such as um, the, the, the weather at the time at, at the, at the, um, uh, for the data that have been uh, acquired, and answer there is a 90% chance that between 62 and 67 croissants will be sold. So that's, that's a bit the, the dream. And uh, and again, this is just one task, and there are many, many other tasks. And of course, this involves, so this particular example involves many, many, many things, such as understanding humans, understanding the data that is in the bakery, because the human didn't give any, didn't tell anything about the data, um, access external data, for example, to, to know about the past weather, um, and the automatic modeling part, which is building a model that can predict the number of croissants that would be sold according to 
um, all the, the, the features, and of course, communicating the result back. And so what I'm going to talk today is about this automatic modeling part, which actually under the hood also include uh, a bit of data understanding and a bit of accessing external data. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so um, we have a few automated machine learning functions in the language uh, that we started to, to implement since version 10. Um, they are very task-oriented functions. So you, you saw example, uh, John gave a few examples of, of these functions. For example, for, for classifications, you will just give a bunch of data to a function called classify, and it will return a classifier. Uh, for regression, there's a function called predict that works the same way. For clustering, a function called find clusters, and there's some other, other parts. And what's automated in, uh, in uh, these functions are, um, uh, so these functions need to understand uh, the type of the data. For example, is this data text? Is it a uh, categorical variable? Uh, are there numerical variables, things like that? It needs to figure out how to pre-process uh, this data. Um, then it also needs to figure out how there are some um, smart, in a way, uh, good features to extract from this data. For example, if it's an image, it might make sense to run a neural network on it uh, that has been pre-trained, let's say, to classify images and, and uh, extract some features with this neural network uh, that will be semantically rich features. Uh, you can also perform feature augmentation. That's, that's, that's um, similar as a weather example that I gave here. Um, if you can, or, or let's say there's a, a city that is in the, data, in the data set, maybe we want to augment the data by adding the population of the city or the country in which the city is, um, because that might help to, to uh, model and answer the question. And the um, and final part uh, that is automated is to select the best model and the best hyperparameters. Um, this is usually these parameters that are tuned by hand um, in opposition to the parameters that are learned by the, by the learning algorithm. And uh, also we want this function to be robust to dirty data. For example, if there are some missing values in the training data, we want it to work. If there's some missing values in the evaluation data as well, we want it to work. Um, and we also want the user to, to have uh, control over what's happening uh, through some lower level uh, specification, but I'm, I'm low level specification, but I'm not going to talk much about, about them. Uh, they're a bit boring, but also through high level user specification. Uh, for example, you might want to say, Oh, I want a classifier, but I want it to be small in memory because you know I want to deploy it on an embedded device later, for example. So you could do that with a with an option performance goal and set it to memory. Or you can say, uh, all right, I have four minutes to train this model, so I want you to use four minutes. And and there's a function, uh, an option that is called time goal to to do that. That's that's a bit the idea of this uh, this function. Let me show you um, an example. Um, so the simplest example possible, we're going to use a function classify. Uh, so uh, here you see it's been given a training set. There's four examples in this training set. Each example is composed of an input and an output. And the goal is to predict the output, which is a class here, can be A or B, as function of the input, which in this case is a numerical value. So let's evaluate um, this uh, code and it returns a classifier function, and then we can start using it. For example, I will ask, uh, okay, one was A, two was A, so 1.6 was probably A, and that's, that's the case. But we can also ask for the probabilities, like how certain are you that 1.6 is A? And in that case, uh, it's actually overconfident that it's A, um, which means that it's, yeah, actually, in a way, it's, it's a bit wrong because it's too overconfident. But that's because the training set is very, very small. Um, in practice, you have larger training set, and the probabilities make uh, make more sense. Um, there's a very similar function that is uh, predict, um, which is not about predicting a class, but predicting numerical values. So let's do um, you know, something like that. And uh, this time it returns a predictor function that you can use in the same way. So, okay, one was 1.3, two was 4.5. So let's try 1.6 again. And it should be probably something between 1.3 and 4.5. Actually, it's funny, it's more than that. Okay, 
And, uh, and you can ask again for the probabilities, but this time, this time since it is a numerical value, you will ask for the distribution. So uh, you can see that it's not very confident about it. So it's 4.6, but plus minus 2.8 kind of. It's a, it's a normal distribution. Okay, so that's our, the, 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 I would say the main automatic, automated machine learning functions we have, um, which by the way are in the, in the domain of, of uh, supervised learning. Uh, that's probably the one that has uh, the used most. And uh, I'm going to talk to more about this one because it's the one I think we've perfected the most. And, uh, and later I will mention the other functions that we have and the other function that we are uh, developing right now, uh, which I hope they have the right to speak about, but that should be fine. Okay, so let's do a, a um, image uh, classification example. So you already saw uh, examples in the implementation, so let's be quick about it. I will spend more time about using uh, you know, analysis tools to understand how good is a classifier. Uh, so I'm going to scrape image from the web. Um, uh, I never done that before, but let's 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 scrape some superheroes. I just saw the Avenger two days ago, and so okay, let let's put Superman. Uh, let's put what Batman, uh, Iron Man, um, Wonder Woman. Okay, let's try this. So I'm going to scrape forty images from the web for each query and uh, so there must be uh, 160 images so actually I'm going to put let's say 20 in the training set and the last 40 in the test set so this is, will be the, the the split that is very classic to do when you train a machine learning model to reserve some data uh, in a test set in order to, to test the performance uh, better. Uh, actually, I can I can look show you uh, what the training that I look like. Okay, so here we go. We have this tag data about a bunch of superheroes, and uh, and let's run classify. And here I will say uh, we have time, so you know it's not many images. So take your time and and just give the best classifier that you can. So I specify that by performance goal quality. And uh, actually, let me just name it. It's going to be easier to play with afterward. Uh, so it's preprocessing the data. Actually, the preprocessing involves uh, what I was talking before, uh, a neural network that extracts features that are, that are specialized for, for images. And that's why we can train with that small amount of images. Uh, like normally, if you start from scratch, uh, training with 40 image by class is uh, impossible, uh, but because we have these uh, semantic features, it, it will it will be much easier. Okay, so so it's trained. Actually, we can have a look, you know, since uh, why not? Kind of look inside to to see what it's doing a little bit, and and you can see that it's okay. There's some missing imputation thing. There's some uh, uh, image conformation, and this is a is a neural network that extracts. Uh, the, the features, and uh, anyway, you can see also a bunch of information about what happened into the, the automation, but that's, that's not supposed to be accessible to the user, but you can still do it by just looking inside the classifier, uh, if you're interested. All right, let, let's, let's, uh, let's try it. So I'm going to grab, let's say, the first three examples of the test set, and let's try it. So I never tried that one, but let's see. Iron Man, great. Okay, we can ask for the probabilities. And uh, well, it's very convinced it's Iron Man. It's actually a bit surprising. Uh, let's look at the others. It's quite convinced as well. Okay, and this this makes makes more sense. Okay, it seems to be a pretty uh, pretty good classifier. Probably the task was not that hard. So let's. Let's measure things a bit more um, in, a, in a better way. I'm going to use the classifier measurements uh, function, where I put the classifier as the first argument and the test set as the second argument. And this returns uh, a classifier measurement object uh, that then I can use to query various properties. And actually, the first property that I should just ask is just a report. Just a report, and the report says, 
Uh, there was 40 test examples. Uh, the accuracy was 87.5, but plus or minus 5% because you know of the, of the size of the test set. A uh, simple baseline would give 30% of accuracy, so we're much better. Okay, you have some other information. Also, the, the time it takes to evaluate a single example, the speed it takes to, when you evaluate many examples, and a confusion matrix. Actually, let's let's look at the, just the confusion matrix. So I'm going to type, uh, oops, confusion matrix. So matrix plot, sorry. And uh, here we go. So that's that's the... Uh, so, so you can see here the number of test examples of a given class that have been classified another class. So these 12 Iron Man are correctly classified. So, okay, Iron Man is kind of perfect. So that's probably why uh, we get this good result. But there is a Superman misclassified as Batman. So let's have a look at this one. So I will say examples. And uh, I will say, uh, let me actually, I think that is, uh, we changed the syntax recently. So a Superman classified as Batman. Here you go. That's a, for some reason, this Superman is classified as Batman. I guess it has a bit of a dark uh, suit you know, on, on, on this one. Um, anyway, that, that's the sort of tools you can use to analyze your classifier and analyze your test set, actually. Because sometimes you'll, you'll figure out that, oh, actually, it was a Batman here. Uh, so that, that's pretty pretty useful tools. Okay, let's uh, continue. So um, now we'll just stress what changed in the latest version. Uh, so something you already saw in this training progress panel uh, when when you train that that shows a progress bar, current values of various various metric, uh, the learning curves, the stop button. So actually, let, let me show you on a very classic data set what it looks like. And, and something that that lasts a bit longer than uh, actually I could I could set a time goal. You know what? I'm going to time goal 60 seconds. So this is going to train for 60 seconds, and we'll have the time to appreciate the the, the training panel. Uh, so you can see time elapsed, the current best method, and here is a learning curve. Uh, so basically, it's um, uh, the systems uh, the system trains various models on various data sets length and you can see that for data set of length here it's uh, 300 the best model has this loss value you can also have the equivalent in accuracy so you can see how uh, giving larger data set leads to higher accuracy and here you can see kind of the learning curve of all the algorithms all, all the models sorry that are tested so currently it's seen that the nearest neighbor is kind of the leading uh logistic is not far away random forests is not so great um okay and oh gradient posted tree seems to have taken the lead so okay let, let's stop it so you have also have a stop button which allows you to um uh, stop the computation at, at any time and return the best classifier so far so i guess okay it shows gradient boosted tree in that case so that's that's this uh, training progress uh, panel, which you can actually control with with uh, you know training progress reporting option. So if I say training progress, let's say reporting none, it won't show anything. Or if I say print, uh, which is useful when you uh, work in a terminal, uh, it will just you know print the the various values uh, instead of um, let's cancel that instead of showing the panel. Okay, and uh, another thing that changed is this classifier information um, panel. Uh, so this is once the model is trained, you can do classifier information of the classifier. And you have this panel that shows you, uh, okay, the input type was image, 10 class, method is gradient boosted tree. Actually, if you mouse over the method, it can tell you um, the options uh, that are used. So kind of the hyperparameters that are that have been used to train this this model and uh, you can see a list of this hyperparameter in the documentation so if i go to gradient boosted tree for example which is probably one that has the most number of hyperparameter we you have a documentation page that kind of explain uh, what this is 
and and gives a list of the of the upper parameters that you can set um, because you can also uh, specify the method and specify let's say with this sort of of syntax uh, let's say max depth um, is two or three that will be the syntax for you to specify this this uh, uh, upper parameters which which we just call options uh, in that context. Okay, and then you can tell you okay various uh, various information, and you can also uh, have a have a look at the, at the learning curve, which, in a way, because it's already estimating accuracy and loss and evaluation time, batch evaluation speed, classifier memory, you don't necessarily need to use uh, classifier measurements uh, anymore. Uh, however, when you want to go deeper, such as analyzing um, uh, Confusion matrix and so on, classifier measurement, it's still uh, very useful for these things. Okay, so that's that's kind of the, what, what was new in the in the last uh, versions of the language. And um, I tell you very quickly, although uh, because I think it might not be interesting for everyone, but just what's going under the hood, under the hood. Uh, so one thing that is happening is we have some automatic preprocessing. So one part is understanding automatically uh, the data. So here is a function. It's it's a, it's an internal function. You, you don't need to to know about it. But for the one that I'm a bit curious, that will kind of understand the type of the data automatically, and then you can create pipelines of of uh, processing such as standardize everything that is numerical, uh, one hot encode all the nominal vectors, merge all the vectors, and uh, and that would kind of perform this operation and give the pipeline that it can be used later. Uh, that's what you can see if you dig inside the uh, right inside the classifier uh, that this 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 um, uh, oh this one will take time. Okay. That the sort of things you can see when you dig inside the inside a classifier. Um, which maybe one day we can uh, turn this tools top level. Uh, that would be that would be great. But as you can imagine it's a yeah, that's, uh, we always try to have a really nice design for everything we put top level, and uh, and and that's why we have to spend some time some time uh, making things um, hidden first, and when we feel they're ready, we make them top level. Um, there's also some some automatic um, conversions happening. For example, if you want, you give some text, but the method that has been specified wants a numerical vector, then this is kind of a backup uh, backup strategy to 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 convert. Uh, things from a text to a numerical vector, and here the path would be to um, you have a preprocessor that changes that in the nominal sequence, which I guess extract words or characters, and um, and then there's something to to calculate a, a TFID vector from this nominal sequence. So that's uh, a bit what's happening under the hood. Another thing that is happening, uh, it's probably the most I don't know if it's the most important, but uh, um, maybe the most interesting. Um, is how to to select the best model and the best hyperparameters, what we call a configuration. And the strategy is, is quite intuitive. It's just to start with the initial set of configurations, let's say 10 or 100 configurations, and then perform experiments on small data set. So basically training these configurations on small data set. So in this case, that is as small as 10 examples, and uh, or here 40 examples. And then only select, only train the most promising configurations on larger data sets. Uh, for example, here you may have 10 trained on 40 examples, but only four trained on 200 and only one trained on 800. Um, so that's a, that's a classic strategy. There's actually some, some uh, uh, like in the literature, there's some uh, related uh, method one is called hyperband um, and uh, so okay so i guess let's look again at the mnist thing and you can see more in real action what's happening so you see this bunch of experiment being done then the best uh, are tested on larger data set and uh, it's going back and forth sometimes when it, when it figures that it has time it's, oh i have time let's let's uh, do more experiments on on, on smaller data sets um, so that's a bit of a, of a sneak peek of the automation procedure. There's, there's a lot of other details, but but I don't think that's uh, appropriate for this webinar. 
And uh, but the nice thing about this automation is that it has nice byproduct. So we can see a progress bar. We can interrupt at any time. Um, uh, we can also say this is time go uh, things, and we can see the the learning curves and have as an output have the measurements and the learning curve, which I believe is very important uh, to decide what to do next. I think learning curve are a super important uh, tool to decide basically do I need more data or not. That's usually the, the, the classic question. And uh, anyway, you can see there was a blog um, a few months ago about about this. Okay, so um, I'm almost done there, uh, and that's good because then we'll have time for questions. So just to tell you, there's some other um, functions uh, in the, like automatic machine learning function in the language. Um, I must say they don't not use yet uh, an automation that is as sophisticated as classify and predict. Uh, so one of our work is to, uh, I mean, it's decent automation, you know, there's a lot of good heuristics there, uh, but we want to, to make it more based on doing experiments and so on, which usually improve by, by a big factor of uh, automation quality. And uh, so these functions are fine clusters, dimension reduction, feature extraction, sequence predict, um, and so on. And uh, maybe I can tell you a little bit about what's coming in the next version, what we're working hard to, to do. Um, it's it's uh, mainly functions in the unsupervised learning uh, domain. Uh, so a function to learn arbitrary distributions. And then basically this function will be used to do, um, uh, and to perform the, the task of anomaly detection or imputing missing values, which is called yeah, missing imputation, uh, or denoising, that's not really a name yet. Um, generate new examples, that would be something cool as well. And uh, yeah, this one won't be for the next version. That's just something that we are a bit uh, dreaming about um, to perform reinforcement learning in a fully automated way. Okay, I think I'm, uh, I'm done here. Um, yeah, just some, some last thought about what we want to do uh, um, to improve automation further. Uh, which is to include more pre-processing in the automation procedure and the combined methods. Uh, I think we can go a long way by, instead of returning just a random forest or gradient boosted tree, just return uh, an average of super vector machine and gradient boosted tree and whatever else performs well on the data set. Um, and also we, we, are, we are thinking quite, um, I mean, we actually already have projects to, to uh, basically learn from many data sets how to learn. Um, okay, I think I'm done here, and uh, for the last next 50 minutes, I will be answering questions. So yeah, don't hesitate to ask anything on the question panel. All right, so let me see, what do I have? Um, Uh, do you support GPU machine learning like TensorFlow? Uh, yes. So we have a neural network framework um, that works uh, very well on GPU. It's not using TensorFlow on the back end. It's using MXNet, uh, which actually is arguably faster, uh, although they're, they're pretty similar. All these frameworks are pretty similar in terms of, uh, of speed. Uh, for the high-level machine learning, uh, GPU will be used to train neural networks, uh, but they, they, they probably won't be used for, for other methods like uh, random forest and, and, and so on. So that's something to keep, uh, uh, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Like don't, don't necessarily need, if you just do classify, you don't necessarily need to buy a big GPU machine. Uh, it might not improve things much. Um, okay, uh, can I just change the parameter and methods or also modify the actual algorithm? So yes, you can change the method and you can change the parameters I was showing before uh, with the grain boosted tree example. Uh, so it's documented and, and you, can, you can set all that up. Like there's a low level uh, access uh, to, to, to this high level function as well. Uh, okay, do you have an example of this workflow using time series? Okay, very good question. So that's that's something we want to, one of the directions we want to go because uh, there's a function called sequence predict, uh, but it's a very specific type of time series at the moment. It's only uh, nominal sequences. So basically, 
uh, let's say, a sequence of words or a sequence of characters. Uh, but we want sequence predict to, to be um, uh, extended to predict arbitrary sequence, sequence of, okay, so time series, sequence of numerical values uh, or numeric vectors, uh, but also sequence of image, sequence of whatever, whatever you want. Uh, so that, that's one of the big things we, we want to work on. Um, okay, so uh, the GPU support is built in. Yes, it's completely built in. No separate license. That's the one thing with with the Wolfram language. You got everything. There's no no box, uh, no toolbox. Uh, okay, uh, can you add your own model uh, to the list of models that uh, Okay, can you add your own model to the list of models that the automated learner tries? Well. That's a complicated issue because there's a lot of pre-processing happening. So it's hard for you as a user to know where your model gets plugged in. Um, so actually, there's a, there's a hidden way to add a neural network in a method. And but 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 uh, I don't think there's a good design to to make that top level. So I uh, don't think we'll provide beside the fact that you can specify the method and the hyperparameters. Uh, Although we could, we could turn these uh, automation algorithms into a, a more generic tools that you can plug whatever you want. That that would be a very interesting development of this uh, of this uh, work. Um, okay, so what, what do we have else? What, hmm. Can we see the Wonder Man classified as Superman? Yes, the one, yeah, the Wonder Woman. Then, uh, where are we? So we want up Wonder Woman. I think it's in. No, I put it in two words. Okay, classified as Superman. Uh, actually, there. Oh yeah, there's three of them. Oh yeah, wow, big mistake there. Okay, well, well, we can say it's quite a special one. There's a Lego Wonder Woman classified as Superman and, and some more cartoonish uh, ones, whereas the typical Wonder Woman would be, uh, yeah, from the movie. Uh, and typical Superman. All right. That's the one that I've been correctly classified. Okay, uh, how can it be used to simplify the creation of a folksonomy? So taxonomy based on living data from feedback like comments or questions about blog articles. Okay, so taxonomy, so I guess it will be more of a cluster uh, problem. And, uh, and there are, there are some, some uh, uh, function about that, some even hierarchical clustering function uh uh that you can let's see hierarchical no this is what the let's go to find clusters and probably links toward the uh hierarchical clustering function uh doesn't seem to passing data into clusters i mean uh for sure we actually worked on that quite some time ago so so there is some hierarchical cluster function somewhere. Okay, maybe maybe I should go to the next question. Uh, we call clustering, yeah. Oh. Okay, maybe I got a question, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure there is a go clustering uh, function out there. Uh, going beyond supervised, can we use prediction based on unsupervised learning? For instance, prediction based on some similar metric on the data. Well, so it's, so, okay, you have clustering, okay. Uh, otherwise, unsupervised learning would be for other type of task. Uh, the task could be um, find the element that are most, like, like a sort of, of, of nearest, uh, but, but using machine learning to kind of do nearest in a semantic space. Um, and this will be the role of, of uh, uh, feature, feature nearest. So that, that, that's a task you can, uh, that you can, um, performing unsupervised learning. Uh, dimension reduction is another type of task. 
and then there's this anomaly detection, missing imputation, denoising. But for predicting something, uh, I would say, yeah, so clustering is probably the, the most, I mean, the closest task to what you are talking about. Uh, let's see. Is sequence predict the same thing as recurrent neural network? Well, very related in a sense that a recurrent neural network uh, is a method of sequence predict. Uh, or will be, I think, at the moment. I'm not sure. No, it's, in your recurrent RNN are not yet into sequence predict, but it will be probably the main method of sequence predict in the future. Yeah, like a very likely a LSTM or, or, or variant of, of, of these. Um, okay, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I think I had some other that I that are. Uh, there was a question that was, how performant are the machine learning methods? How many samples can they handle? Okay, so very good question. So the, the, the speed of the methods are, are, so let me tell you, okay, I mean, for, let, let's split between the neural network uh, framework and the automatic machine learning function. Um, the neural network framework can handle data arbitrary large, uh, you, can, you can kind of code uh, the function that will grab the data somewhere and create a batch for the neural network to learn because the neural network doesn't look at all the data at once. Uh, it looks at data um, uh, step by step and, and learn in a kind of online fashion. Um, so, so and, and you can uh, use that on, 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 on the big GPUs, so there's really no, no problem. Uh, for the automatic machine learning functions, um, most of it is limited by your RAM. Uh, so I would say that typically you have, I don't know, 16 gigabyte of RAM. Uh, when you start getting to models that are larger than, than uh, 5 gigabytes, uh, then you should start to worry a little bit about what's, uh, what, what will happen. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's a limitation of these automatic machine learning functions. Uh, but in practice, um, you can have, I mean, if you go on, on Amazon, you can rent a machine that has a large amount of RAM. I mean, you can rent a machine that has a terabyte of RAM. Uh, so, um, and run your, your automatic machine learning function without trouble uh, there. Um, yeah. uh, there was another question that I, that I put down was, uh, I have trouble trusting that a computer is trying the correct set of hyperparameters, that is finding the best possible model uh, for the task at hand. Are you doing same meta modeling to figure out the best parameters? I think there's a question during John's uh, talk uh, to figure out the best parameter and you're possible to, you know, to go inside in the model choice. So yeah, so it's, it's kind of answered by, by, uh, by the thing that I was showing before. You can see the learning curve about what, what has been tried. Uh, you can also look inside the classifier. You can see the result, uh, the parameters that have been chosen. And um, one interesting thing is that if you put a large time goal, like time goal two days, uh, then you can you can look at the, um, at the learning curve and so on, and, and it, it will try many more hyperparameters, many more methods, and uh, maybe that can help you being convinced that it's the best uh, model that is uh, that is chosen. Um, all right, let me see, there's some new questions. Uh, tuk, tuk, tuk. Well, I think that's, uh, let's see. Okay. Thanks, Etienne. Um, I do have a final poll question to, to pose to the audience. Um, if you have, completed yep your share thank you very much for that um extended q a time that was really um that was really worthwhile to 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 get those answers out to people um the the poll we're putting out now is about uh your preferred resource for learning more about data science and machine learning in data science um so if you could give us some feedback here this is uh, especially helpful for those of us on the wolfram u team who are helping to prepare courses uh, for, for that purpose. So I'll give you just a second to respond to that. 
voted. Um, I do want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this does conclude the presentations. We hope you enjoyed the talks and learned about concepts and tools you can use to unleash the power of your data. An email will be sent to everyone in the audience with a link to this webinar recording, and we'll also have the download links for the presentation notebooks. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again online on June 6th for the third and final webinar in this series. Our topic will be curating data and integrating the Wolfram Data Framework. You'll receive a reminder email about this session. I also want to uh, invite you to sign up for a machine learning webinar uh, that may be of interest to a number of you. It meets on the 30th. I see we've got those poll results up. Thank you. And uh, we're very interested to see that, especially with the interactive course. That's, that's uh, a move we'd like to, uh, a direction we'd like to move to in the future with Wolfram U, with videos and exercises available. So that's really good to see that people are interested in that. Um, let me, share my screen um, I want this is the machine learning webinar series you can um, sign up for this from Wolfram U and Cassidy's put that link out for you um, the the topic on May 30th is deep learning for audio analysis and natural language processing so um, I think at least one person has asked about audio analysis and speech recognition and so this this webinar will be of interest to you um, as you exit today a survey will appear on your screen and we we really do appreciate your feedback we use these results to guide us in making improvements to the Wolfram technology stack and adding the features most important to the user community so thank you again for joining us and uh, we will Hope to see you next time. We hope you have a great day.